All right, good morning. I want to welcome you this morning to Brian Bible Church. And for our study this morning, I want to look at a very important verse in the book of Romans. Romans 9, 6, just one verse, a verse that I think is critical to our understanding on who Israel is. And this is going to be another message in my mind that completely destroys the false doctrine of Israel only. So let's start by looking at the context of Romans 9. Romans 9 is a theodicy. Do you know what a theodicy is? Anybody know what a theodicy is? We've talked about it before. You must have forgot. Okay. A theodicy is the vindication or a defense of God. Now, the word theodicy comes from a compound Greek root, theos, which is God, and dikos, which is just. And the goal of a theodicy is to exonerate God from all blame. It's saying that what God is doing is absolutely just and righteous. Now, have you ever found yourself defending God? I'm sure you've heard things from people such as, well, if God is love, how could He allow this to happen? You know what that is? That's an accusation against the love of God. See, the Bible says that God is love, but many question that when things don't go the way they want them to go. Okay? And many people's view of God is far from biblical. Well, when we get in a situation like that, when we hear those things and we're defending the love of God, we are involved in a theodicy. We're defending God. The emphasis in this chapter is on the sovereignty of God. And what Paul is doing in Romans 9, 10, and 11 is giving a theodicy, giving a defense of God. Now, Romans 9 is a difficult chapter for many Christians to handle. For in this chapter, I I got this picture in my mind. I remember the first time I was teaching on the sovereignty of God. You got to go to Romans 9, right? And I had a, a friend come to me afterwards and been a Christian all his life and had his Bible and opened up his Bible and showed me the Bible. And I mean, marks, marks, marks everywhere underlined. Got to Romans 9, not a mark, not a highlight, not a scribble. You know, he goes, look, and you just jump over that because that, that's crazy. That's some, that's some serious stuff there. And Paul, I think, in Romans 9 raises some of the toughest questions ever faced by man as he contemplates the actions and the working of God. You know, men have a problem with the doctrine of God's absolute sovereignty. It's like, who does he think he is? Well, he thinks he's God. And if you understand what God is, then that makes sense, all right? Many statements in this chapter are really hard to accept because there are things said here about the sovereignty of God that fallen man just resists. But we need to allow the Scriptures to be the final authority of everything we believe, and not our emotions, and not our traditions. Here's the problem that Romans 9 deals with. The Hebrew Scriptures, the Tanakh, are filled with promises that God made to Israel. The nation was uniquely chosen by God to be blessed and to be a source of blessing to the world. We see that in Deuteronomy 7, 6 through 8. He says, For you are a people holy to Yahweh your God. Talking to Israel. Yahweh your God has chosen you to be a people for His treasured possession. So God, of all the people on the earth, God chose Israel. Out of all the peoples on the face of the earth. It was not because you were more in number than other people that Yahweh set His love on you and chose you, for you were the fewest of all peoples. But it was because Yahweh loves you and is keeping the oath that He swore to your fathers, that Yahweh has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery and the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. So he's saying God delivered you from Egypt because He loves you. And it was to Israel that Yahweh revealed Himself. It was Israel that received the Messianic promises. They were 
God's chosen people. Now, we talked some about that last week. God had just rejected the nations. He had just said, I'm done with all you people of the Tower of Babel. And then we get to the very next chapter, chapter 12, and God calls Abraham and starts all over with a new people. And in the midst of that, right away, he tells Abraham, you'll be a blessing to the nations I just got rid of here, all right? But Israel was God's chosen people. Amos 3, 1 and 2. Hear this word that Yahweh has spoken against you, O people of Israel, against the whole family that I brought up out of the land of Egypt. You only have I known of all the families on the earth. Now, the New American Standard Bible takes the Hebrew word yada and translates it here, chosen, instead of known. But known is a better translation here, and it indicates an intimate love relationship. Okay, Adam knew his wife, and they had, it's, an, it's not just, oh, I know her, you know, it's an intimate relationship. God had an intimate relationship with Israel. God knows every single individual, but he knew Israel in a special way. They had a very privileged position. Romans 9, 4, and 5, he talks about Israel's privilege. He says, they're Israelites, and then he says, to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants. The giving of the law, the worship, the prom- these are all strictly things that belong to Israel. The promises, to them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Just in case you're wondering, the ESV puts the commas here in the right place, okay? Christ, comma, who is God over all, all right? just in case you had any question about that. All right. Now, with privilege comes responsibility. Look at the last part of the verse in Amos 3, 2. Therefore, I will punish you for all your iniquities. Israel became proud, and they missed the true end of all that they had, which was the coming of the Lord Yeshua to atone for their sins. Now, in the first couple verses of Romans 9, Paul is expressing his sorrow for his countrymen, and his readiness to suffer for them. He says, For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. Now you got to get what he's implying here. He's implying that Israel is no longer the people of God. They're no longer blessed. They were, in fact, now cursed He says he wished he could take that curse for them. If God's chosen people are now cursed, then we got to ask, has God gone back on his promises to Israel? I mean, all these promises throughout the Tanakh that he promises them, and now we get Paul saying, hey, they're cursed. Has he rejected his chosen people? Was Israel really cursed, or was Paul just bitter because of all the beatings he had received from the Israelites? Well, let's look at what Yeshua had to say about the nation of Israel. In Matthew 21, 18 through 19, he says, In the morning, as he was returning to the city, he became hungry. And seeing a fig tree by the wayside, he went to it and found nothing on it but leaves. And he said to it, May no fruit ever come from you again. And the fig tree withered at once. Was this the Lord just had a little tantrum because there was no figs? No, this is an illustration. I believe the fig tree here is a figure of the nation Israel. And throughout Israel's history, God constantly hungered for His people to bring forth fruit. The Gospel writer spoke of the physical hunger of Yeshua as symbolic of God's hunger for the fruit of His people. And so Yeshua pronounces a curse here on Israel because of their failure to bear fruit and their ultimate rejection of Him. Now, many of Yeshua's parables refer to Israel's rejection and thus their destruction. Matthew 21, 33. Here, another parable. There was a master of a house who planted a vineyard and put a fence around it, dug a wine press, and it built a tower and leased it out to tenants and went to another country. Now, who's the vineyard here? Okay, a little reluctance there, a little hesitation. (laughs) <laughs> Let's go to Isaiah to make sure we understand who the vineyard is. Isaiah chapter 5. Let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard. 
Okay, so we're talking about the vineyard here. My beloved has a vineyard on a very fruitful hill. He dug it, cleared it of stones, planted it with the choicest vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it. He hewed out a wine vat in it, and he looked for it to yield grapes. That's what you do, you know. That's the whole purpose of this. But it yield wild grapes. Now, wild grapes here, I don't know that's a great translation. The Hebrew word here is bu'ushim. And according to Brown, Driver, and Briggs, bu'ushim means stinking or worthless. So it's not that it's just not producing. It's producing stuff that's not good. It's stinking and worthless. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem, men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done for it? When I look for it to yield grapes, why did it yield bu'ushim? And now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge, and it shall be devoured. I will break down its wall, it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste. It shall not be pruned or hoed, and briars and thorns shall grow up. And I will also command the clouds that they rain, no rain on it, for the vineyard of Yahweh of hosts is the house of Israel. Now you hear the, you know, what he's going to do? Did you get, catch that? Because they just brought forth Buhushim, okay, therefore, here's what I'm going to tear down the wall. I'm going to, it's going to overgrow. He's talking about a, a judgment on this because the vineyard of Yahweh is the house of Israel. And the men of Judah are his pleasant planting. And he looked for justice, but behold, bloodshed. And for righteousness, but behold, an outcry. So God is looking for Israel to produce justice and righteousness, but they're just producing stinking, worthless stuff. Now, it's clear that the vineyard is Israel. Israel's God's vineyard. Now, keep that in mind as we go back to Matthew 21. When the season for fruit drew near, he sent his servants, the tenants, to get his fruit. Now, what is the produce? What is the fruit here that God is looking for, according to Isaiah 5.7? It's justice and righteousness. In biblical usage, righteousness is rooted in covenants and relationships. For biblical authors, righteousness is the fulfillment of the terms of a covenant between God and humanity or between humans in the full range of human relationships. The one who in faith gives himself to doing God's will is righteous. He goes on in Matthew 21, 35. And the tenants took his servants. Okay, here, this is God's vineyards. He wants some fruit from the vineyard. He owns the vineyard. But when he sent to get the tenants, took the servants, and they beat one. The servants are the prophets of God going to Israel, crying out to them. They killed another, and they stoned another. And he sent another servant, more than the first. And they did the same to them. Finally, he sent his son. Oh, you get in the picture? He sends him his son, saying, they'll respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let's kill him and have his inheritance. And they took him and they threw him out of the vineyard and they killed him. Yeshua here is prophesying what the Jews, what the leaders of that day are going to do to him. The people he's speaking to, this is what they're going to do. When therefore the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? Now this is interesting because the answer here is coming from the Jewish leaders. They say, they said to him, the Jewish leaders, he will put those wretches to a miserable death and let out the vineyard to other tenants and will give him the fruit in their seasons. Yeshua said to them, have you, have you never read in the scriptures the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing and it's marvelous in our eyes. Therefore I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing its fruit. So Yeshua tells them very clearly that because of their rejection of him, because of the rejection of the prophets of God, that the kingdom will be taken from them. We see a very similar parable in Matthew 22, 1 through 10. Speaking of Israel, Yeshua says, The king was angry and he sent his troops and he destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. Man, this should ring so many bells for us as we understand what happened in AD 70, okay? These parables are teaching that Israel 
listen, lost their privileged position. Now, in light of all this, okay, they're God's chosen people. God made all these promises to them. Yeshua comes along and says they're going to be judged. Paul comes along and says they're under a curse. In light of this, the question is, has God's plan changed? Has God changed his mind and said, hmm, that's not working. Let me try something else. Is Israel's rejection as a nation a going back on his word somehow? I mean, he told them they were his people, they were special. Has God broken his promise to Israel? There's two possible conclusions to be drawn here. Either the gospel that Paul is preaching is false, or if it's true, the promises of God have failed. See, the Messiah and blessing to Israel were inseparably connected. The Jews would say either Yeshua is not the true Messiah, he, because he cursed and rejected God's people, or the word of God has proven false. So God's justice and righteousness are being called into question here. Wait a minute, God. This doesn't seem right, doesn't seem consistent. And believers, this is very relevant to us today, because if God broke his promises to Israel, what assurance do we have that he'll keep his promises to us? What assurance do we have that when he says, Whoever believes in Him will have eternal life. How can we, well, is that true? Is that guaranteed? I mean, if He broke His promises to Israel, it doesn't put us in too good a place. So in verse 6, Paul, having finished his introduction, basically, into this section, begins his theodicy. And Paul's going to show his readers, the first century Roman believers, and us today, in these verses, that Israel's rejection is not inconsistent with the promises of God. To say that the nation is accursed is not to say that God's promises have failed. So let's look at Romans 9, 6. For it is not as though the word of God has failed. That's what he's been talking about. He said, wait a minute, no, the word of God hasn't failed, because that's what they're saying. The nation's accursed. The Lord's saying they're going to be judged. This is going back on the promises. No, no, no. The word of God hasn't failed. For not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. Now he says it is not. In the Greek, this is uhoi asde, which means but not as such or but not in a similar way. In other words, the word of God hasn't stumbled in a similar way as Israel when she rejected her Messiah. No, it's Israel that stumbled, not the word of God. And the complete Jewish Bible puts it this way. But in the present condition of Israel does not mean that the word of God has failed. For not everyone from Israel is truly part of Israel. Now, the word of God here means anything which God has spoken. Here, from the connection, it should be understood in the more specific sense. It is the word of promise in the covenants alluded to in verse 4. It refers to the great promises God made to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob confer a blessing upon their seed. Now the phrase, has failed, is from the Greek word ekpipto. And ekpipto means to fall out of, to fall down from, to fail, to be without effect. Paul uses this verb several times in Acts 27 in regard to his voyage. It's used of a sailing vessel that goes off course. It was used of flowers that were fading. So we could put it this way, it's not as though the promises of God have gone off course. They haven't failed. They haven't, you know, faded away. And verse 6 corresponds to Romans 3.3 3 that says, what if some were unfaithful? Does, the faithful? does their unfaithfulness nullify the faithfulness of God? Well, if Israel is unfaithful, then what does that do to God's faithfulness? The whole problem of whether God is being faithful to His covenant with Israel and the work of Christ is what Paul is now dealing with in Romans 9 through 11. He's got to deal with this. Because Israel, they've got a privileged position. They think that's guaranteed no matter what. So they're like, hey, wait a second. We can't lose these promises. Israel's lack of faith on the part of some doesn't mean then that God's promises that were entrusted to them have failed. All right. If God's promises have not gone off course, then how can Israel be accursed? when God made so many promises to them. And Paul's going to teach us that God's promises have not failed. Listen to this. They've been misunderstood. 
That's hard for us to believe, isn't it? I mean, can you imagine someone misunderstanding God's Word? You might be able to think of a few promises that Yeshua made that are misunderstood today, right? I can remember Him saying, Behold, I come quickly. And we're like saying, Yeah, that's going to happen real soon now. And I'm like, 2,000 years later? It's coming quickly. No, people. Often we get the Word of God confused, all right? Often we do. Many of His promises have been misunderstood by His people. And it's sad to do that because you, if your theology is wrong, it's going to affect your life. It is not as though the Word of God has failed for not all who are descended from Israel not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. Now, the last half of this verse, Paul explains how these promises were misunderstood. I can't emphasize enough how important this verse is for us to understand. This verse is the key to understanding Israel and understanding the promises of God. And the first question we must answer is, who or what is Israel? What does the term Israel mean? Well, let's first look at its etymology. Israel is a compound of two words, Sarah and El. You've got one of those, right? El, God, okay. Sarah. Sarah means to fight, to struggle, or to rule. And El, of course, means God. Now, some have taken the name Israel to mean he who struggles with God. And that kind of makes sense when you understand who is the first to get this name Israel? Jacob. Okay, so he's first called, he's struggled with God, all right? Or he who rules with God. But in Hebrew names, sometimes God is not the object of the verb, but the subject, like Daniel, means God judges, not he judges God. So Israel means God rules or he who rules with God. The first use of the term Israel in Scripture is found in Genesis 32, 28. Then he said, Your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. Now, what I want you to see here is the name Israel is not first given to the nation, but rather it's first given to an individual, to Jacob. And Jacob was a type of Christ, meaning that for a time as the head of the covenant, as an individual with the name Israel, he typifies the Redeemer who is going to be the true Israel. So Jacob is called Israel, and then Jacob marries two sisters, Leah and Rachel, and with these two women and their maids come the twelve sons who became the twelve tribes of Israel. Ruth 4.11 says this, Then all the people who were at the gate and the elders said, We are witnesses. May Yahweh make the women who is coming into your house like Rachel and Leah, who together built the house of Israel. So now we see it was Israel. Now we have a house of Israel. Jacob's 12 sons are called the house of Israel. That's a term that refers to the 12 tribes. It refers to the nation. Israel, Jacob's sons, were delivered from Egyptian bondage. They became a nation at Sinai. When God gave them His law, which they entered to on Pentecost. And then they're now called the house of Israel. For the cloud of Yahweh was on the tabernacle by day, the fire was in it by night, and the sight of all the house of Israel throughout their journeys. So, after the nation split, the ten northern tribes were called house of Israel. The southern tribes, which were Benjamin and Judah, were known as Judah. But that's not pertinent to this, just letting you know that, okay? So you can forget about that right now. All right. So Israel is a term that's first given to Jacob. Then his sons were called sons of Israel. And later they're called the house of Israel. So the term Israel came to be used of the nation that God had called out of Egypt. And I think, no doubt, this is how most Christians think of when they hear the term Israel. They, they, this is usually all they think of. All right, National, physical Israel. That's what Israel means to most people. Well, Paul tells us in this text that there are two Israels. 
And that's what you have to see here. We know that one of these Israels has to be physical national Israel, right? Not all who are descended from physical Israel, natural Israel. There's no disagreement here. Everybody agrees that's physical Israel, that's the nation. What's the other Israel? Well, that's where the disagreements start. We have your physical Israel, those who descended from Jacob, and then we have true Israel or spiritual Israel. So we have physical and true Israel. Now Paul is saying that God's promises have not failed. And here's why, people. God never promised unconditionally each offspring of Abraham covenant blessings. God never intended that all the nation Israel would be redeemed. Physical Israel. We we're familiar with that. We know that the nation today, we, that's, nation, that's Israel. But here's what people don't seem to get. Within physical Israel is a remnant, true Israel. Within that group, there's the true, the spiritual Israel. And you got to think of it like a peach. You got the meat outside, and then you got the pit in the middle. Well, that pit is true Israel, okay? Now, the new covenant's not like that. The new covenant's like a potato, okay? Everyone in the new covenant is true Israel, all right? Physical was different. God called true Israel out of physical Israel. So who is true Israel, then we have to ask? Well, is it the church? I would say yes. But what is the church? The church is the body of Christ. And what I want us to understand is that Yeshua is the true Israel. He's the true Israel. It is in Him and in Him alone that the promises of God are fulfilled. We could say this. They are not all in Christ who are physically descendants of Jacob. Romans 9 goes into that so strongly. Well, let me attempt to prove to you that Yeshua is the true Israel. Israel's prophets clearly anticipated a time when Israel would be restored to its former greatness. For example, Isaiah 41, 8 and 9, But you, Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the offspring of Abraham, my friend, you whom I took from the ends of the earth and called from its farthest corner, saying to you, You are my servant, I have chosen you and not cast you off. This is a messianic promise. Yeshua is the servant. The same promise is reiterated in the next chapter of Isaiah. In verse 1, he says, Behold my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen, in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. Again, another messianic promise. Messiah, the servant, is portrayed as one who acts in God's name to bring glory and deliver his people and to be a light to the Gentiles. 42.6, I am Yahweh. I have called you in righteousness. I will take you by the hand and keep you. I will give you a covenant to the people, a light for the nations. Again, in verse 49, he says, Is it too light a thing that you should be my servant and raise up the tribes of Jacob and bring back the preserved of Israel? I will make you as a light to the nations that my salvation may reach the ends of the earth. Now this shows us that the servant, Israel, will bring true Israel back to God and also extend Yahweh's salvation to the ends of the earth. Now notice what the disciples ask Yeshua. Then when they had come together, they asked Him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? So they obviously saw Christ as the servant, the true Israel. Is it now the time for you to do this restoring? Now, dispensationalists, given their so-called literal hermeneutics, and, and people, please be careful, you know, of being literal in your interpretation of everything. That will take you in some crazy roads, okay? I mean, there are some things that are literal. There are some things that are metaphoric. There are some things that are apocalyptic. There are some things that are teachings are didactic, and some are parable. We have to understand the different forms of literature. But dispensation will take everything's literal. 
And they get in Revelation, and wow, they come up with some crazy, crazy interpretations. There are, dispensationalists are bound to interpret these passages from the Tanakh literally and assign the fulfillment of these prophecies of Isaiah to a future earthly millennium in which Israel coexists with Gentiles under the reign of the Davidic king. But is this how the New Testament interprets these messianic prophecies regarding the servant of the Lord? See, the gospel writers interpret these prophecies from Isaiah as fulfilled and the messianic mission of Yeshua. And we have New Testament interpretation, people. We've got God's interpretation of things. We have to understand that. Look at Matthew 12, 15 through 18. Yeshua, aware of this, withdrew from there, and many followed him, and he healed them all and ordered them not to make him known. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. Behold, my servant, whom I have chosen, my beloved, with whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, and he will proclaim justice to the Gentiles. So Matthew's talking here about Yeshua's ministry, what he's, he's healing people, and he says, oh, this is what Isaiah talked about. And he quotes Isaiah 42.1. And he tells us that Yeshua fulfilled what Isaiah, the prophet, spoke about the servant of the Lord. So according to Matthew, who is inspired in his interpretation here, the servant of the Lord is not Israel, it's Yeshua. You say, well, is that how Isaiah understood it? It doesn't really matter how Isaiah understood it. We're getting an interpretation here from the Lord, okay? And in Acts 3.13, Luke speaks of Yeshua as the servant of the Lord. Now let's look at another text that clearly refers to Israel. This is, a, this is a great text, Hosea 11.1. 1. When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. What's Hosea talking about? He's talking about the exodus of the nation Israel from Egypt. Okay, if you look at the context of this, it's really clear that's what he's talking about. Out of Egypt I called my son. All right, cool, we got that. Hosea knows what he's talking about, got it all down. Well, then let's go to Matthew. And he rose and took the child and his mother talking about the Lord and the Lord's early childhood, mother at night and departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. Now watch this. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet, out of Egypt I've called my son. So what? So Matthew's saying, Hosea was talking about Yeshua, but Hosea didn't know that. Hosea said, he's talking about the nation Israel. And Matthew takes this passage which clearly refers to Israel, and he tells his readers, this is now fulfilled in Christ. He does this to prove to his largely Jewish audience that Yeshua is the servant of the Lord, foretold throughout the Tanakh, especially in Isaiah. So, Yeshua, people, is the true Israel. He is the true seed of Abraham, and this is the point that Paul makes in Galatians, and I think he makes it so clearly that we ought to know this verse, verse 16. The promises were made. God's promises were made to who? Abraham and his offspring. And the automatic thing is to think, yeah, he promised all Israel. That's not what it says. And then it goes, it makes it clear, it does not say to offsprings, plural. Referring to many, but referring to one and to your offspring who is Christ. So the promises were made to Abraham and Christ. Please get that. In Isaiah 41.8, the servant is called the descendant of Abraham. But you, Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the offspring of Abraham. Who is that? That's Christ. So Paul tells us this is not referring to many but one. Listen, Christians are Abraham's offspring and heirs to the promises because by faith we are united to Christ who is the true Israel. Abraham's one seed, Yeshua. He is the true Israel. We are in Him. We are the true Israel. Galatians 3.14 So that in Christ Yeshua the blessings of Abraham might come to the Gentiles. That's us. Mm -hmm. So that we might receive the promised Spirit through faith. We inherit all 
the promises that God made to Abraham through Christ. Everything we are, everything we have is by virtue of our union with Christ. And that only comes by faith. Listen carefully. The Abrahamic covenant was, a, covenant was a promise made to Abraham and Yeshua, the seed of Abraham, that he would be made great, the father of many nations, and that in him all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And that blessing comes through the gospel. This promise was fulfilled spiritually and ultimately in Christ. Now in Exodus, the book of Exodus, Israel is called God's son. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says Yahweh, Israel is my firstborn son. Paul calls Yeshua God's son in Romans 1.4. And he was declared to be the son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness, by his resurrection from the dead, Yeshua the Christ, our Lord. By calling Yeshua the Son, Paul now assigns to Yeshua the designation for Israel as God's Son, making Yeshua the true Israel. And since Yeshua is God's true Son, then the membership in the people of God depends on being rightly related to Him. Apart from a relationship to Yeshua, you cannot be a true Israelite. The psalmist calls Israel God's vine. You brought a vine out of Egypt. Well, who was that? Well, we know who that was, right? You drove out the nations and planted it. Israel is the vine. We already saw that in Isaiah. Isaiah 5 makes it really clear. But notice what Yeshua calls himself. I am the true vine. The true vine? Yes, Israel was a vine. I'm the true vine. My father is the vine dresser. Yeshua is the true vine, and only in Him are these promises of God fulfilled. In 2 Corinthians 1.20, Paul says this, For all the promises of God find their, find their yes in Him, in Christ. Everything. Yeshua is the true Israel. Received the promises of God that were passed down from the fathers, from Abraham, from Isaac, from Jacob. He was, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15.54, the last Adam. He obeyed in every place where the first Adam failed to obey. He was, as true Israel, obeying where old covenant Israel failed to obey. And we see these pictures so clear in the New Testament as we know what we're looking for. The nation Israel was taken into the wilderness and they failed to obey when they were tempted. But Christ was taken into the wilderness. And he was given the same temptations that Israel was. And he remained faithful. He was true. Israel proved to be the unrighteous son. Yeshua proved that he was the righteous son. What Paul preaches does not speak against the promises of God. Israel is God's people by faith, and all who believe in Christ receive the promises that God made to Israel. The church, those of us who have trusted Christ, are the Israel of God. Believers and only believers are true Jews. Now, this is where my, I struggle a little bit because I'm thinking, hmm, Israel only is right. We're Israel. And the Bible is only written to believers. So, so in that sense, yes, the Israel only doctrine is true if you understand who the Israelites are. Not nationally, but spiritually. I'm an Israelite. So, therefore, the Bible's written to me. Galatians 6, 15 and 16, he says, For neither circumcision counts for anything. Now, look, people, this was a major deal for a Jew. If you weren't circumcised, boom, you get booted out of the national Israel, okay? You can't be uncircumcised to be in Israel. But he's saying, Paul's saying, circumcision doesn't count for anything, nor uncircumcision. What does count? A new creation. And as for all who walk by this rule, the rule of the new creation, peace and mercy on them and upon the Israel of God. Those are believers. To understand that God keeps His covenant promises, we must understand that not all Israel is Israel. Later in Romans 9, Paul quotes from Isaiah and he says this, Only a remnant will be saved. 
Well, that sounds kind of like Isaiah 10, 22. Look at it. For though your people Israel be as the sand of the sea, only a remnant of them will return. The promises are not to physical Israel, only to the remnant. Only to those who are in Christ. And if Yeshua is the true Israel of God, and if the New Testament writers applied to Yeshua, those prophecies from the Tanakh referring to Israel as God's son and servant, then what does this understanding do to the dispensationalists and the Zionists who believe that the nation of Israel is God's chosen people and the sole inheritor of God's promises? And that to be part of Israel, one must be of the proper lineage and nationality. And you know what this really sad here, people, is most of the church would fall in this category. And this is one of the reasons this text is so important, because this text destroys Zionism. All right? Now, Zionism is a political movement built on the belief that the Jewish people deserve by right to possess the land of Palestine as their own. Okay, so then you have Christian Zionism. What's that? It's essentially a Christian prophetic support for Zionism. It's seeing the modern state of Israel as the equivalent to biblical Israel. And this is where people mess up. And they'll say things like, Never mind what Israel does. God wants us to support them. Have you ever heard that from any Zionists? I hear it all the time. We've got we to protect it. He that touches Israel touches the apple of God's eye. I've heard that so many times I could throw up. <laughs> Interpret it correctly. All right? And so we just have to support it. And so they blindly support Israel no matter what Israel does. Israel invades Lebanon and kills or injured an estimated 100,000 Lebanese and Palestinians, most of them civilians. And the Zionist says, hey, they're God's people. we got to stand behind them. They bomb a sovereign nation such as Iraq. The deliberate, methodical brutalizing of Palestinians. See, they wanted that land, but people were in the land. What do we do? We just go in there and kill them, wipe them out. And the Christians are going, oh yeah, the sad thing is, what, who are the people in the land? Many of them are Palestinian Christians. And so Christ, American Christians are saying, yay, kill those Christians over there, because the Jews need that land. I'm like, how twisted is their theology? How deviated has the church come? And this is why doctrine matters, people. I mean, so many people standing behind the Jews, physical Jews, Physical is, there is no Jews today, okay? We've gone down that road, but there aren't any Jews today. The bloodline is so intermingled and so mixed up, there's no Jews today. But there's people who say they're Jews. It's just a political movement. And it's sad. Dispensational Christian Zionism, which is the dominant form, is pervasive within mainline evangelical, charismatic, and independent megachurches. And they just think, we got to support Israel. No matter what Israel does, we got to support them. And, you know, that's really sad, people. Christian Zionists believe that the national Jews deserve, by right, the land of Palestine as their own. They think that land belongs to them because they misunderstand the promises of God. Modern, unbelieving Jews have absolutely no theological and therefore no historical and legal right to the land of Palestine. None. Modern day Judaism is a cult. Oh, people are going to say I'm anti Semitic. No, I'm just biblical. All right, listen. Modern day Israel, here's what I like to say they're Christ rejecting, covenant breaking, God haters. That stirs people up, doesn't it, Kath? <laughs> I said that to my neighbor and whoo. <clears throat> But much of the church holds to that. It's blasphemy. It's heresy. Christians have no theological stake in the modern state of Israel. Let me make this clear. Israel is anti-God, anti-Christ nation. All right? Now, I didn't say that. John did. Okay? John 2.22. 
Who is the liar? Well, let's talk about it. He's the one who denies Yeshua the Christ. Okay, who does that define? Who denies Yeshua the Christ? Israel. You know it's against the law to share the gospel in Israel? But yet Christians support Israel. Send them money. Help them out. How twisted <laughs> is their theology? John says, who's the liar? It's the one who denies Yeshua the Christ. That's Israel. Oh, he calls them the Antichrist. They're Antichrist. He who denies the Father and the Son. Now, get this clear. This has to be clear. No one who denies the Son has the Father. So where does that put Jews? National Jews. Where does it put them? They're Christ-rejecting God-haters. They don't have the Father. They're hating God because God sent His only Son. And they rejected Him. They said, no, we won't have this man reign over us. Judaism denies the Son and therefore is a cult. And unless Jews individually turn to Yeshua, they remain under the curse of God. And if our politicians could understand this, okay, it would make a difference in their support because so many just, you know, you, you wouldn't believe how many of our politicians are Zionists. You know, they just got to stick with Israel. They think, well, as long as we stick with Israel, God will be on our side and we'll be all right. No, two Israels, people. Physical Israel, which, as I said, really does not exist anymore. It's just a modern-day political movement. They call themselves Jews. They're not really descendants of Jacob anymore. But the purpose of this distinction is to show that the covenant promises of God did not have respect to Israel after the flesh, always to true Israel, who's Christ. Yeshua the Christ and all who trust Him are true Israel. Therefore, the unbelief and rejection of ethnic Israel as a whole in no way interfered with the fulfillment of God's covenant purposes and promises. He never made promises. It wasn't, they weren't to them. It was to the true Israel. God is faithful, people. God is just. He is righteous. Listen, if God makes a promise, we can count on it. We can take it to the bank. But we need to make sure we understand the promise and not misinterpret it, okay? Because, boy, it's so easy to claim promises for yourself that, like, well, first of all, that wasn't for you. you got to understand the Word of God. And then we can understand that God's Word hasn't failed, and it never will fail. There's great comfort in the immutable Word of God. Cling to His promises. Trust Him. He's faithful. Deuteronomy 7.9 says, Know therefore that Yahweh, your God, is God, the faithful God, who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love Him and keeps His commandments to a thousand generations. God is vindicated. That's Paul's whole purpose. He keeps His word. And what great comfort we have in the many immutable promises that He has made to the church. But again, we have to do our homework to make sure we're understanding who is this promise to, who is He directing it to, who is He saying it to. And then when we understand it, we can rest in His blessed promises to us because He's a covenant-keeping God, a faithful God. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank You that You are the faithful God. Thank you for communicating your word to us. I thank you that we have it, Lord, in written, unchangeable form that we can study, that we can read over, we can pray over, we can spend time in to learn who you are and what you want from us. Father, may we cling to your promises, knowing your faithfulness. May they strengthen and comfort us through every and all situations we face in this life. Lord, thank you so much for what you've given us, your children, for the hope that we have because of you. Amen. Amen. Questions, comments? <laughs> Gary. <laughs> <laughs>
one comment about um, <clears throat> the beginning you talked about God choosing Israel out of all the, the nations of the world. But not only that, he, he created them. There was no Israel until he made them. Well, he that's right. Them he yeah. formed them and then, you know, started with giving promises to Abraham and from Abraham brought a nation forth. and Just as he brought, he created us. He brought us into existence as his chosen. You know. mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And one thing I never understood <clears throat> until you brought up this preterism heresy. Uh, <laughs> that, you know, why all this political pressure to restore Israel to Palestine? What happened? Why did they, how, why did they leave? You know, well, mm -hmm. understanding that they were driven out by God in 70 AD, that, that, and nobody, you know, the general world doesn't understand that. Never heard of the destruction of Jerusalem. You're right. You know? Many things never heard that, yeah. and they don't understand it. You know, because people don't have, talk about it. If they have heard about it, which I know one big organization in our town who's done a whole movie about it, for some reason it doesn't connect with the things it connects with. They don't connect. Here's the thing that I think is cool that we talked about last couple of weeks with the feasts. You know, just ask people, when did Israel quit sacrificing? And why? Well, 87. Well, okay, what's the significance of that date? So all the judgments in the New Testament talked about to come on Israel, and then we see this judgment on Israel, and then we see Judaism in, in biblical form stops. There's a lot of clues there. <laughs> but those judgments on Israel were too physical, Israel. <laughs> what about the uh, Messianic Christians and groups like Jews for Jesus? My personal view on that, which, you know, that's, again, my personal view, <laughs> is they're building walls that God tore down. All right? There is no Jew or Gentile, God said. You know? So they're building walls and saying, hey, we're a, a Messianic Jew. Okay, well, then you're a Christian, right? Because I'm a, I'm a true Jew. You're a true Jew. We're all the same. God tore down those walls. They, they had that separation. It seems like the Jews were, these Messianic Jews are building them back up, and they're keeping a lot of the Messianic customs, which are not a problem, I guess. I mean, if you just want to do it, but, you know, if, if they're thinking God is restoring these old things, they're not. They're done. They're finished. So a Messianic Jew is a Christian, right? Mm -hmm. How's he different from me? Any special, he got anything over God on me? Nope. Christ died for me. Christ died for him. We're both evil. We're brothers and sisters in the Lord, and mm -hmm. don't build those, you know, mm -hmm. don't build those walls, mm -hmm. you know? I think I think our our Jewish roots are important. I mean, we go back through the you know the Bible and we see the Jewish roots. That's where we came from, people. Christ came from the nation Israel. We are in Christ. Okay. Yeah. Romans eleven talks about the tree, and you know we were grafted into the root of the tree. I believe the root there is the Abrahamic promises. God grafted us into those promises through Christ. Mm -hmm. So I think it's cool to understand our Hebrew roots, but I think the Hebrew roots movement is, you know, off base because they're trying to restore some of the things that God has said. We moved on from that. We're done. Anybody else? Mm -hmm. People, this is, a, I think, it's just a really important topic because, like I said, most of, you know, most of the church today believes that Judaism is a really special thing and God loves those people over there and He cares about them and whatever they do is okay. Even though they reject it. Even though they reject Christ. Okay, I got a question here. It says, land promises fulfilled for the kingdoms of this world have become, the, become when Christ was declared ruler of all that included the little piece of land called Palestine. Yeah, people so much say the land promises. God said they'd have the land. Well, let me challenge you this. Go back and Look up the boundaries of that land, because if it's specific land he's given them, show me the boundaries. You're going to find four different boundaries. That, so which one is it that they're supposed to have? No, the land promises are all fulfilled in Christ, okay? Because the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord. And it's in Christ, again. I'm not trying to make this physical. You know, and so many people are looking to, the Lord's going to come back and set up a physical thing here. And, you know, no, no, no. 